Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this gathering of believers today, Lord, and, mm-hmm. and Lord, we just pray that you would have your way with us, Lord, that you would use Pastor Izzy now to speak to each one of us, to encourage us, Lord, to equip us for this coming week, and Lord, help us to be ready to do whatever you call us to do. Lord, equip us and encourage us, Lord, and get us ready. We ask that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look at this, back to this, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said, that this church at Corinth was a letter, he said, that was read and known by all men. And he said it wasn't a a letter that was written with ink, you know, human pen and paper. It was rather, it was a letter that was written, it says, by the Spirit of the living God upon the tablets of human hearts. And he and Paul went on and said, don't you know that your life is a letter that people, whether they ever read this Holy Bible and and learn about the Lord. Your life is a letter being read and known by all the people around you. They know whether you follow the Lord or not by just watching your life, whether you like it or not. Do people watch us as Christians? Do they scrutinize everything we do? You know, if you don't think so, you should try wearing the hat up here. I don't have a hat on, but I mean, be the pastor in front. They're always scrutinizing everything you do, everything you say. And man, if if you have any kind of complexes, they're going to get worse. When you have to be in front of everyone, it's just like put the magnifying glass on you, you know. And um, I just go, Lord, why? Why would you pick me? Now, I told you last week, my qualifications were found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul said God chose the what kind of things of the world? The foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And that's how I got qualified to do the ministry. He said, that, that fool will do. I'll use him. And, and you know, if you just keep... A, by the way, some people say, I'm self-deprecating when I say that. No. I'm just saying God knows what he's doing. He doesn't have to pick the winning guy, the bestest guy to put on his team. In fact, he doesn't do that. In fact, he picks the guy who couldn't win without him, and then he makes the team win, and everyone goes, well, we know it wasn't the team players. There must be a God. I mean, that's a miracle those guys won. That's how he likes to stack the odds in his favor. He's so good at that. And so Paul says, guys, just remember, your lives are a letter. Now, how many of you thought about that this week, if you were here with us last week, that your life was a letter that was being read and known by all people? They were watching what it is that the Spirit of the living God was writing in your heart. Because when God writes something in your heart by His Spirit, it's powerful. People start to notice things about you as, as the Spirit puts His ink to our heart. Now, Paul goes on, and, and we had to stop at this. Kind of, I hated stopping because he said that we have such a confidence through Christ towards God. Our real confidence is through Jesus. I don't really have confidence towards God except through Christ. What Christ did, that finished work on the cross is what gives me confidence. When he hung on the cross, the last three words he said was what? It is what? Finished. I paid the full price for their sins. It's finished. And when Christ did that on the cross, he, he said, I did that for you. I gave my life for you. And my confidence to go before God is because of what Christ did. That finished work of Jesus makes me go, wow. In Hebrews it says, let us, at the last verse of chapter 14, or I'm sorry, chapter 4, it's verse 16. It says, let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we can receive grace and mercy in our time of need. Whenever we, anyone need grace and mercy for this week? Just me and Cindy and... Mads, oh, Connie, a few of us, yeah? Just a few need grace and mercy to make it. But we have a place, an actual spot to go to to receive grace and mercy, and that is called the throne of grace. I love this in the New Testament. God's, God's throne is called the throne of grace. What a title, huh? The throne of grace. You need grace and mercy? I know where you need to go. 
You draw near to the throne of grace. Now it says, draw near with confidence. Not draw near, oh no, I'm afraid, I don't know what he's getting. It says you get to be confident. You get to go right up to God's throne and say, I need grace. I need mercy. You don't have to be afraid because we draw near by, the, by what Christ did. Not because of our goodness, because of Christ's goodness. I always go on his merit, not mine, when I go before God. But let me show you today what happens when we draw near to God. What's the Bible tell us? Draw, you draw near to God and God will what? Draw near to you. You resist the devil, right? And what will he do? He'll flee. Anyone would like that turkey to get out of their way? I mean, has anyone ever felt like the devil's closing in, nipping at your heels, causing you trouble? Here's the solution. You draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. You resist the devil. You say, forget you, devil. I'm not going with that. And it says, and he'll flee. And this is an important thing that as believers we do in our Christian experience. Because otherwise, if we even just entertain hang, letting him hang with us, something bad's going to... You let the devil hang out with you, and it's going to trip you up. So I want to encourage you today. Look at what happens when you draw near. Now Paul goes on, he says, guys, it's not because our adequacy is in ourselves. We know that. It's not because I'm adequate of myself that I consider anything as coming from myself or ourselves. He says, but my adequacy is from who? From God. That's where I'm, my full adequ adequacy is God, who made us adequate as servants. This is where we had to stop last week, and I hated doing this. He has made us adequate, fully what do you say? Qualified is another English word for adequate. He, he's made us qualified to be servants of a new covenant. Now, this isn't very popular to teach in some Christian circles in America that um, we were called to be servants. Jesus said, you want to be great in my kingdom? What do you do? Be the servant of how many? Of all. He didn't say, you want to be great? Tell everyone else to serve you. But see, America, Christian, Christian American experience in some circles has kind of adopted corporate America business model where, you know, like the president is in to on the top and he's in charge and the vice president and down the, through the officers and all the way down to the poor janitor down there emptying the waste baskets. And everybody has their position and, and, the, and the great... The, the guy who's the greatest is at the, in, the, in the top office in the glass room, you know, with all the, the view. And Jesus comes along and says, if you want the top position in my kingdom, wh where do you go? Down to the bottom. You go down and start delivering in the mail room or, or picking up the rubbish. And you, you, you want to be great in my kingdom, he says, you be the servant of all. And he, Jesus even said this of himself. He said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to what? To serve. And we're called adequate as servants. Now, you might not believe that, but we need to establish this as a baseline. Do you guys understand that it's not God that is expecting you to be qualified by your own merit? I love that saying. What Someone paraphrased this loosely. They said, uh, God doesn't call the qualified. Rather, he qualifies the called. If he calls you, he's going to, help qualify you for the job. You, you might not think so. You might, I can't do that. But don't worry. He has a way of getting you ready. That's the beauty of serving a living God. So you don't have to worry. You have been made qualified, adequate, as a servant of the living God. He's got everything you need. He knows how to use your personality, how to use your skills, how to use your gifts. He knows what gifts you need to complement those gifts, so because you, you might not have everything you need. But that's no trouble. We're talking about the living God. He can give you everything you need to do whatever the calling he has for you. And I love this. I love serving the Lord because he has never failed me once on getting me adequate for service. Now, it's not popular to say, you know, I mean, when people ask, well, what's your title? I remember... I, I got the privilege to listen to a man named Gail Irwin. He's kind of this pastor of pastors sort of fellow. He pastored for so many years that he actually now speaks into many pastors' lives. He's got suspenders. He's from, you know, down in the south. He's got big belly. And he just, 
he has a simple way of saying things. You know, if you're going to be great, you have to learn to be the servant of all. It's an upside down principle to the corporate Christianity model. It's come in in the Jesus style. Do it the way Jesus would. How can I, how, by the way, we should all learn this line. How can I serve you? He said he was on a plane one time, and um, the person leaned over him and said, uh, well, what do you do? So, you know, what, what, what's your name? What do you do? You know, the pleasantries of sit, you're stuck in a seat next to someone for a long time in one of the metal tubes. And so he, he said, well, my name's Gail. And, and um, he, he thought, well, I'm a minister, minister of the gospel. Of course, the, the person just kind of looked puzzled. Minister, what's a, they didn't know what a minute, they didn't know that term. And he goes, oh, don't worry. Minister just means glorified slave. I'm a servant, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. And the person looked at him like, what kind of title is that? You would say that's your title? Whenever you say you're a minister, by the way, that's what you're saying. I'm a slave. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I'm a minister of the gospel. My whole title doesn't really break down to too, you know, impressive to most people. What do you do? I'm a slave for God. Yep. Work for Jesus. They look at you like pretty weird. You're, you're a fruitcake. But I'm not a fruitcake. Because there's nothing better than serving the living God and his son who died for me. And all I have to do is realize he has made me adequate to be a servant of this new covenant. He did it. I didn't have to do it. We need to establish that as the baseline before you go any further, that all of our adequacy isn't based on us. It's based on what Jesus did for us. Then if we go start as that, as the, you know, like the, the foundational the, the, the very, the very, yeah, the, the very, the very foundation we're going to build on, we're going to do just fine. He made us adequate to serve in the new covenant. Now listen to this, not by the letter, but by the spirit. He said, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, He's referring to the tablets of stone that Moses got, remember, up on the mountain. He says, so that the sons of Israel could not even look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? Now, he's referring to the book of Exodus. Would you turn with me to Exodus 34? I want to show you real quick. Some of you are already, this is like, just re re revisiting an old uh, passage, but some folks don't know this. Moses, Moses is accredited with what we call the, the letter of the law because he's the one that went and received the Ten Commandments up on the mountain there, and he, he, he went up into the Mount of, uh, of Sinai. It's found in Exodus 34, verse 29. It says, It came about that when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of testimony were in Moses' hands. He was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of he was speaking with God. He didn't actually know. He came down off the mountain. Can you imagine this? Picture this. Here's a guy carrying two tablets of stone that the Lord wrote up on the mountain. He comes down off the mount, and when he gets down, his face is shining. Now, why is his face shining? It says it right there. Who had he been spending time with? God. Now it says that he didn't get to see God face to face, but he saw the glory of God. And just, just to be able to see the glory of God made Moses' face shine. By the way, I, I submit to you, even to this day, there are people that when they go into worship and they worship the living God, something happens to their face. I've seen it happen. I've seen people worship the Lord, and there, there, there's no other way to explain it. They just, it's like you can tell they're in the presence of the living God. And something, an actual physical change takes place. You look at their face, and it's like it, it, it becomes lightened. It, it's brighter. There's this, there's this well, it, it, in, the, in the Hebrew, the Shekinah glory, the glory, that bright light of the Lord begins to radiate from 
that person spending time in the presence of God. And people that are worshipers, I can always spot them. They, they you know, maybe it's just because my calling is to be a worship leader also besides pastoring. You know, I, I spot those people that when you worship the Lord, they begin to just, well, how do I say this? Leave behind all the extra stuff down here and put their attention to the Lord. And I'm, you don't have to have your hands up to do that, by the way. I just, some people do. But I'm saying the, the, there are those individuals that when it comes time to worship, they really truly acknowledge God with their whole being. And as they do, and I submit to you, how many of you have, ex have, have, have noticed this? That those, there are those individuals, they worship the Lord, and it's like all their troubles just fall away. And they're just sitting there basking in the presence of God. And something happens to them. Now, I... I re actually recognize this not because it happened to me, because I saw someone else starting to shine brightly by just worshiping. In a, in a congregational setting, they were in the midst of the... It's so funny. In the middle of a whole congregation singing, you'll have one guy over there picking his nails and another guy just sitting there tapping his feet, looking around, checking everything out. And, and yet, you, you could have someone else just prostrate, laying flat on their face before God. Communing with God in, a, in such an intimate way, they just, they can't even stand up. They just fall down. You know, some people just kneeling before the Lord. Some people just raising their hands. And if you look at the expression on their face, it's really interesting. The ones that really seem to just say, Lord, I just want to be with you. Something starts to happen to their face. Now, I, I, I ask you, how many of you spend time seeking the Lord like this, and you come down from that moment with the Lord and people go, hey, turn that off. You're shiny. You're too shiny. Uh, the reason I say this is because I read ahead. L look what they did to Moses. He gets down. He doesn't even know here in, in, in Exodus that his face is shining. And when Aaron and the sons of Israel, in verse 30, they saw this, that Moses, the skin of his face, the, literally the skin of his face shone, it says that, that they were afraid to come near him. Man, you are like too bright. They didn't want to come near him. So Moses called them and Aaron and, and the rulers in the congregation, they returned to him and Moses spoke to them. And afterwards, all the sons of Israel came near and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. Now when Moses had finished speaking with them, he would put a veil over his face. It says, and then whenever Moses went in before the Lord, he would take off the veil, of course, until he came out. Whenever he came out, he would speak to the sons of Israel what the Lord had commanded. And then the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face would shine. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. Each time before he, I mean, come out shiny. Hey, everybody, been talking to God. Well, yeah, we can tell by your face. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if we really shone for the Lord like that? People are like, dude, that guy, is, he's been spending time with God. Look at his face. I mean, he's like bright. Like, there's something about it. You can't even, Moses, they were telling Moses, could you, like, it's too bright. They were scared of him. How much do you think he's shown? Like, just like a little bit of brightness in his cheeks, a little redness, or what? Or do you think he, like, had light? Reflecting, I mean, think about this. We could do this like with special effects, get Spielberg to do this in a movie, you know, make Moses' face shine. And it's kind of, if it's going to, okay, look, if it's going to scare a bunch of guys, a bunch of, a bunch of, uh, the whole, you're talking the whole nation of Israel is freaked out because Moses is shiny. How shiny do you, do you have to be to get people afraid? I mean, they were afraid of him because when he came out from spending time with the Lord, he was bright. It's funny to me that bright makes some people uncomfortable. The light makes some people uncomfortable. The Bible says it. It says that there's no fellowship between light and darkness. So if someone's walking in sin and in darkness, and you're walking in the light, don't be surprised if you don't get along with them. They're going to go, you're too bright. We don't like that. You're, you're, you're too shiny. And if you've never heard this, some of you may have even heard this. How many of you had a, someone come up to you and go, Oh, there's like a light about you. Like a shiny, you have a shiny aura. Anyone heard this one? 
You have this, this bright aura about you. That's today's vernacular of a description, which, by the way, when someone does that, I, I, raise your hand if you ever had that happen to you. It could be in a grocery store or something. Someone comes up, man, you have some, there's a light. There's a light in you. There's a, you know what you do? You go, that's Jesus. He's the light of the world. I, I invited him into my heart. He's, you're just seeing him shine. Now, I'm stoked when they say that because I don't care. They, sometimes you have a golden aura. I was in KTA many years ago, and this lady is behind me going, you have a golden aura. I have never seen such a golden aura. It's like a godly press. And she's telling me this gold is a godly thing. It's not a man thing. It's, you have a god aura around you, you know, shining from you. And I was like, you have weird terminology, but dig what you're saying, lady. You know, that you could actually perceive. I go, you're obviously spiritually perceptive. Have you heard of Jesus? Because if she could perceive that there's a light, all I have to do is point out who the light is. Jesus is the light of the world. And I have him in my heart. And hopefully, someone's going to go, wow, you got light. It, they never say that about you as a Christian. You might want to be checking out your heart. And the reason I say that is because when I was young in the Lord, one of my first Bible studies I ever attended at youth group was taught by the assistant pastor of the little church up in Verde Valley, Arizona. This is up in northern Arizona, about 100 miles north, Cottonwood area, Sedona, if you've heard of Sedona, that, that region in northern Arizona. And the assistant pastor, just a few of us kids, he's like, and kids... um. Well, sin, I'm going to explain sin in a real simple analogy. Now, how many of you grew up with, um, th we were in the farm, so I totally got this. We used oil lamps, um, kerosene lanterns or oil lamps. Uh, they have a glass little globe that sits on top of this little bowl with a, with a wick inside of it. And you turn the little handle and make the wick come up. And, you, you know, you light it and you trim the wick and it gives off hopefully good light. Now, there's only one problem with those oil, old style oil lamps is in, you can get the wick and the, the stuff all perfect, so it's shining nice and bright. Except that if the glass, the globe, is all filled with black soot from the flames licking, you know, they maybe got it out of control a little bit and it, it did the little wispy black thing that just throws the soot on the glass. If it gets all black, it doesn't matter how bright the light is inside. The light doesn't get out. It, it, the, the little lamp doesn't work. And this is what the, the youth pastor, Bill Elander, taught us. He said, you guys are a lamp. You're a lamp in this world. God, Jesus has made you a lamp uh, uh, for, for him to shine through. He is the light inside of you. The only problem is when we sin, it's like that black soot stuff gets in the inside part of our globe of the glass. And what we have to do as Christians is we have to repent of that sin and we have to go to the Lord and, and ask him, create in us a clean heart. And make a right spirit with us. And, and, and wash away all that soot. And when you do, of course, what will he do? What, what, what's he say? If we confess our sins, First John tells us he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to one more thing, what's he say he'll do? Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So he was teaching us that verse in First John. That he'll cleanse us. He'll make our lamp. Oh, the glass will be clean, shiny. Now, if it's clean and shiny, and Jesus is inside of you, guess what? Someone's going to walk up to you and go, Trent, man, you've got a shiny aura. There's a light about you. What, where'd you get that? And that's when you can say, oh, that's cool. You're spiritually perceptive. That's Jesus. Good eye. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. The person uses, okay, so they use some new agey terms. That's their lingo. That's what they understand. That's the way they express it. Don't knock them. Just say, you, you're spiritually perceptive. Can I tell you about what that light is? Would you like to know? Because if God gave them the perception to see it, let me tell you, you're a letter to be known and read by all men. And if you're not going to let them read the book, you're like, I see light. Nope, you can't talk. Don't look at my book. You don't get to read. Come on, you're sp you got to open up. Let them read the book. Jesus is in here. That's the light you're seeing. And Paul, 
pulls right into the church. He goes, guys, let me tell you, there's two ministries. There's the ministry of the letter of the law, and there's the ministry of the spirit of the law. The ministry of the letter came through Moses, and it had glory. No problem. He said, lots of glory. In fact, it shined. Moses shined. They'd say, cover it up. It's like Rudolph, shining too bright. Put a, put a veil over that thing, Moses, right? That's what they were doing. It's almost reminded me of the Rudolph story. You know, cover up that nose. Moses, you're just too bright and shiny. We can't stand it. We're scared of you. Moses would cover it up until he went back in with the Lord. Then he'd uncover it. And then he'd come out shiny again. And he'd tell him what the Lord said. And then he would cover it up again. Now, Paul tells me something that I never knew about this story. Paul says that Moses covered up that glory because of a, a certain fact. Let me show you this. Maybe you, you already spotted this, but I, I, I found this really cool. He says right here, he says, the ministry of, of Moses in verse 9 of condemnation has glory. And if it does, well, how much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory? For indeed, what, what had glory in this case had no glory because of the glory that surpasses it? For if that which fades away was with glory, then, listen to this, that, he said, much more will that which remains be in its glory. So he says, Moses' glory, he would cover it up because it was fading. It, 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 didn't, it didn't last. You know, it's kind of like, um, I don't know how to explain. You, you know those glow toys where you... You, you, you stick the light on it, and then you turn off the lights, and the little thing glows for a while. And then after a while, what happens? It starts to fade and fade, you know. It, at first, it's really bright, and it, it's got that glowy stuff in it that, that picks up the light. And I, I forget what it's called. What is that stuff called? The, the, you know, you, 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 we have a dog toy at home that glows in the dark when you turn off the lights. I can always spot it. It's a little dog bone chew thing. It's rubber. I'm like, It's blue. Without the lights, but then you, I mean, with the lights, and then you turn off the lights and it glows. Like they put glow stuff in the dog toy, in the toot. They don't, it's for puppies. You don't want them to lose it, even in the dark. You want them to know where to chew. Chew that, not the couch, and not my shoes. And so they put glow stuff. I'm like, okay, so they put this glow stuff in the, right as soon as they turn off the lights, that little dog bone glows really bright. You come back a couple hours later and it's, you can barely see it. By the morning, it's gone. Needs recharging. I submit to you, the same thing happened with Moses' face. When he went in with the Lord, he was shiny. When he came out, they were like, whoa, really bright. He'd just been charged up. But then he would cover his face, and only Paul, Paul, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, says that that ministry which he had was actually had a fading glory. He had to cover it because it wasn't staying bright. It was slowly fading away until he went back in, took the veil off, and recharged. Now, Mo Paul says if Moses had glory that faded, and that was, a, that was still glorious. I mean, come on. That, wouldn't that be, ha, would anyone here volunteer to go into the presence of God and come out shiny? Just to say, so it says, prove to me there's a God. You go, just wait here. I'll be right back. I'm going I'm to go into his presence. I'll be back. And, and I mean, you come back and you are like glow in the dark bright. I mean, you're just like, Wah! you know, bright light. And they're going, woo. So much so that it scares them. That's how bright you are. That was Moses. Paul says, and his ministry was called the ministry of the letter of the law. He wrote the very, the, the letters, the commandments of the law of God. He said that, that ministry of the letter that was with glory, but a fading glory. And there is now a ministry of the Spirit. This ministry, it says, remains. It doesn't fade. The ministry of God's Spirit is a ministry that holds fast, continues on. And this ministry, listen to this. Well, he says, this ministry, therefore we have such a hope. Because it says, we, listen to this. We, I love this part. The, the, um, Verse 12, therefore we have such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. And we're not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. This is where I get the fading away thing from Paul. 
that Moses' glory was fading. But in their minds, it says their minds were hardened. For until this very day, the, the reading of the Old Covenant, whenever it's read, the same veil remains unlifted. You, you know that it, to the Jewish folks, oftentimes when you read them scriptures, they just look at you dumbfounded like, I don't get it. And th for those of you, how many have any Jewish friends? Any of you met some Jewish folks that you've tried to share with? And they just, you talk to them about things of the Lord and they just look at you like, blank. Or like, you're stupid. And there's a veil. And Paul tells us there's only one thing to remove this veil that's over their eyes. He said that which, is, which removes it is Christ. Because it is removed in Christ, he says in verse 14. And to this day, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You know, sometimes you're going to be witnessing to someone and they're going to look at you like you are from Mars. You are crazy. You, where are you, you know, you're like not, you're dis, you're disconnected from the world or something. And you're like, yeah, I am. I'm actually connected with heaven, but you need to be connected too, because that's the source of life. Life isn't down here, guys. The source is upstairs. And to help them to know this, all we got to do is say, well, let's walk in this new ministry of the spirit. A ministry that has a glory, it says, that doesn't fade. The ministry of the Spirit is powerful. It's awesome. The things that God's Spirit can do to help someone, I mean, when someone is hurting, He can touch them and heal a broken heart. He can, how many believe He can heal someone, like, physically? They have, they're, they're paralyzed. Can He heal them? Yes. yes. Anybody here witness God ever do anything like that, that you could give an amen, yay, that God d does actually heal people? Even in this day, I mean, today, in these days we live in. Because sometimes they read Bible stories and go, oh yeah, I believe it happened back then. But not for today. I'm like, what? God quit? I should quit too. I mean, if God quit, I'm done. I mean, there's no reason to do this. If God's not doing the job, I'm, I'd be a solo act without him. That would be stupid. The only way, the only way to do this is, well, who's my adequacy? It comes from God through Christ. It's all about him. I got to stick with the guy who does it all. And he still heals, even to this day. In fact, one of the greatest examples I ever saw of a man's face shining was, was at a, an event. We had this old church gathering. I've shared this testimony before, but I was kind of whining to the Lord in my early Christian faith about I always get to lead people to Jesus. I always get to teach Bible studies about Jesus. I always get to tell them about you, Lord. And I always get to, I don't know, I get to baptize people. And I get to, you know. But I never, I, I never see anyone get healed. You know, when I met this one Christian, they, they, they said all they did was pray and, and touch the person, lay hands on them, like you say, and, and the person was healed. And I haven't ever seen that, you know. I was kind of... I was young Christian, okay, give me a little slack. I was like new at this thing. I was like, me, 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 I want to see this. And the Lord goes, okay. And we went to this church gathering and, and I, w w it, was like, it was like a, a bunch of us churches gathered together. And there was a fellow back then named John Wimber. He started, he was a Calvary Chapel pastor that, that started having the, the moving of God's spirit happen at every one of their services at the end. So they started calling afterglows. And, uh, and then pretty soon they said, yeah, John, Chuck Smith, the founder, said, you know, John, we love what's happening, but everyone's saying, well, how come that's not happening at the other Calvary Chapel? Why don't you call yourself something? They call themselves the Vineyard. If you ever heard of the Vineyard Church, this is where it started. And this fellow, John Wimber, he was the, the first Vineyard pastor, who was a Calvary pastor. And he had come over to Arizona when he was still a Calvary Chapel at that time. And we had a whole bunch of us all to gather together. And he was talking, and he was saying, you know, Jesus says things real simple. You know, he says that I, I give you authority over demons and over sickness, and I give you that authority. And, and so he sent his disciples out. Well, they came back. They, they were flipping out. They're like, yeah, the demons are subject to us in your name, Lord. And, and the sickness, and they're just like getting all excited. And what was Jesus' answer to them? Don't get excited about that. Get excited that your names are written somewhere. Where, where was that? the Lamb's Book of Life. Be excited about that. 
and, and then, but, 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 Lord, this is really cool. And so, John Wimber gets up, he gives this, like, simplest Bible study I ever heard. Jesus gave them authority. He said, go out and do it. They went out and did it. It worked. This is the whole sermon, all wrapped up, like in five minutes. This is from a pastor who's used to going for hours and hours, you know. And you're like, wow, that was long. Not. And he goes, so, um, Jesus said do it, so, um, well, let's Nike this. Just do it. Okay. And then he began to, to move in the, in the gift of the Holy Spirit called the word of knowledge. And he goes, there's a person over here that has an area that, that, that you, you have a problem with your back. Would you, if you would like prayer, raise your hand. And the person raised their hand. And he goes, okay, you guys around him, just lay hands on him, pray for him. You don't need me over there. I'm not saying special. God, God uses us all. So they, and he goes, and there's another person over here struggling with, they're fighting cancer. And, um, and would you raise your hand? And they raise their hand. Okay, guys, pray for that person. And he keeps going around the room, and people, like, literally are getting healed. Paralyzed people are, are getting healed right in front of me. Right to my side, this side, that side. I'm like, this is cooler, but I never get to do this. Man, man, you know. Does God ever accommodate our, our wah? Do you think? I, I submit to you. He knows where we're at. He goes, okay. And this little lady taps me on the shoulder. She goes, young man? I go, yeah. She goes, I'm Claire. You see that fella at the back, way at the top? And there was this, we were in this big amphitheater uh, setting round stage thing. And way at the top, <laughs> way up high, Way removed from everyone was this guy standing up there, in blue jeans, just like a, a, a regular, we call like polo shirt, real, real stout looking, I mean, real strong looking guy. And he's standing up there and he's just standing there like this. And she goes, he has a problem with his leg. You, would you boys, would you be willing to go pray for him? And I, I go, yeah, sure. And I turn to my friend Carl. Carl, you want to go with me to pray for that guy? Yeah, sure. So we jump over a few aisles to get out because we're pinned in. And we were right up near the front. And we run up the thing and we get up there and I, I think to myself, I'm so spiritual. I'm going to see if this is really God. Hey, mister, you need prayer for anything? You know what his answer was? No. Like, are you sure? And, and he like, I've asked for prayer so many times, I, and I'm like, well, and I don't want to say that the lady said your knee needs some prayer, so I'm just waiting to let him tell me. Are you sure there's nothing you need prayer for? Your leg's not bum? You don't need prayer for anything? And he's, I didn't say anything about the leg, I just waited, and he finally took his pant leg, he went like this, and he, he started like shuffling it up, and as he did, there was a brace on both sides of his leg, one of those metal things with the joint at the knee, and it was whole, you know, Velcroed all around, and he reaches down and he unvelcros the leg, and this leg is um like this muscle on the back of his calf right here. This part is torn away and is down here at the back of his ankle. He had had a, he was a steel construction worker, high-rise worker, and a beam had swung into him and sna just snapped his leg. And the muscle tore away and went down into, you know, it's like a, people don't realize the muscle stretched, you know, connected at both ends. Well, it disconnected from the back of the knee. So where's it going to go? Ping, like a rubber band just pulled down. And it's now at the back down here of his ankle, and it looks like a big grapefruit. It's at the back of his ankle. And you can see through the skin. I've never seen this. I mean, I, I'm fascinated with physiology. I don't know if you are, but you could see the bones in the back of the leg. I didn't even know. Like from the backside, because the skin, it was only skin covering bone. All the muscle was down here at his ankle. And he goes, yeah. He goes, I've had prayer. For, I, I, I've asked for prayer nine years for this. And, and he's a union construction worker, so they can't let him go, but he can't go up on the high rise where he likes to be. And so he has to be ground support with his hobbling leg. And he's, he goes like this, and he pushes his leg, and it snaps that way. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
And then he pushes his leg and it snaps that. There's nothing holding this knee together. I mean, that braces what was holding. And then they, they're really gross. He pushed backwards. And the thing went like a bent knee the wrong way. And I just was like, okay, you need prayer. And the, and the Lord just says, <clears throat> are you going to be a servant or are you like Mr. Proud? Get down there and pray for the guy. So I go, do you mind if I just kneel down and pray for you and put my hands on your knee? And he goes, whatever. Now this is always encouraging for your first time ever experiencing a healing, let me tell you. Great intro. Whatever. So I put, <laughs> I put my hands on this guy's knee like this. I'm kneeling down. I'm looking at it. It's freaking me out because I can feel the bones in the back of his leg in my fingertips. Skin over bone, not muscle, like it's supposed to be. No, the tendons are destroyed. They're tore off. And I'm like, Lord. <clears throat> that pastor dude said, just do it. So, okay. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I just, I, I, who am I? All of a sudden, I'm in, like, in the middle of this conversation with the Lord about, I'm nobody. I don't even have the, I don't have the power to do this. I can tell. I, if it was within my power, I would do it. But I can't just go, be well, and it's made well by my power. So where's the source of power? Where's the power to heal? In me? Where's my adequacy? In Jesus. I go, Jesus, you're the one that has the power. You're the great physician. Lord, if there's anything, and I remember what I was praying, just in case you ever get the opportunity, let me tell you what I was praying. Lord, in case my glass is dirty, and I'm not really shining for you, and I'm not really letting you pass through me, just cleanse me. Make me a vessel for you to do your work through. That's literally what I prayed. And when I did, I had my hands on his leg. By this time, this has been 20, 30 minutes of talking to the guy, finding out the whole story, how the beam crushed his leg and all the stuff. And, and, then, and b this time, Claire has made her way, this little auntie has made her way all the way to the back of the stadium. And I'm kneeling down. My friend Carl is standing with his hand on the guy's shoulder. And I go like this, kneel down, and I, I have my hand on his knee. And I feel Claire touch the middle of my back. And I hear her agreeing with us in prayer. Lord, just touch him and heal him. I can hear her talking softly behind me, you know. And I'm sitting there praying, silent, Lord, just clean my glass so you can do your thing. And all of a sudden, I feel this hot, hot touch, like, like a hot electricity, almost like a fire, pass through my shoulder blades all the way down my arms and into my hands. And this guy's leg goes like this. <laughs> And the, the calf muscle reattaches under my fingertips to the back of his leg. In my hand. Freak me out. I was like, Whoa. oh, yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> and this guy looks at me. I mean, you talk about like shock look in the face. He was like, oh. and then he looks down and his leg, which was, okay, the muscles here had been like doing lots of work to try to compensate because this whole part's detached. And all this muscle's all wonky and, and it goes back together in perfect like shape, fullness. The muscles are plump. And he looks down at that thing and he looks right at me with like big eyes. Like, like, and then what's he do? Stomps it, pushes it, pushes it, we won't go, push, tries pushing it, it's fixed. Right? And, and then, I just, I'm like, whoa, that was weird, Lord. And I back up, and the guy, he takes two, he, he jumps, he stomps a little, he jumps up and down really high, and then he does something. He looks heavenward, and he starts saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And as he does, tears are coming down his face, and this is a big grown man just, thanking the Lord, and his face starts to shine. There's no other way to explain it. The guy's face was like bright. Like he was talking straight to Jesus, and Jesus was talking straight back to him. And he didn't care what anyone else thought. This dude was having a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus because he knew it wasn't this kid that... 
But she said, it was Jesus. He's going, thank you, Jesus. And his face is so shy. And I'm like, that was that part was really cool. <laughs> I got to be like that. Where I thank you, Jesus, so much that when people see me, they go, man, your face is shining. And by the way, for us worship folks, this is one of the perks of being called in this calling. Is we can go do this all the time. We can, we can just go worship the Lord, right? We can just sit there and worship him and let him just, let his glory radiate from our being. And people, by the way, will start to notice. In fact, that's when I get the most compliments about my shiny aura. Golden, yellow, white. <laughs> I just laugh. I go, I wonder what song I was singing this morning that got, you know. But, but it wasn't a song. It was getting in the presence of the Lord. And that's the ministry of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit of God does, is bring us into His presence. And that's a lasting a lasting glory. That's what Paul's trying to describe. The stuff of the, of, uh, that Moses wrote down, all those letters of the law, that, that has a fading glory. But we get to live in a new covenant with a lasting glory. It's beautiful. Wherever, when, and whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil, if they don't get it, just say, hey, have you tried turning to the Lord? Because if you do, he'll lift that veil. You can get it just as shiny as I am. You just got to ask him. And what's it? I'll, I'll end with verse 17. He says, now where the Lord is, it says, now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, some of you already know this verse, verse 17. What is it? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. Liberty. Freedom. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that comes in your spirit. Man, I don't know, you know, when I tell people, God really heals even to this day. We've seen people healed at, here at the beach. We've seen people get up out of wheelchairs. I love the Lord. Is so, he's real. I mean, and I know it's not us. I mean, I just know it's the Lord. So there's great freedom in the Spirit, the work of the Spirit. So I want to encourage you in that this week, that you just realize it's not because of you. It's your adequacy is from Christ. God did it for you through his son. And you're plenty adequate to use as a servant. I, I used to, man, Lord, who am I that you would use me? Has anyone ever felt like that? Lord, who am I that you could use me? Don't worry. He goes, I can use you. Me and Trent got in the club. I told him last week. Because we're the fools. We're willing to be a fool for Jesus. Okay. It sounds like a strange qualification, but it works with the Lord. Because he loves someone who's willing to go out and do what he says. And it might look foolish to people. You know, some people would say, even with Aaron doing what he's doing, it's, it might seem foolish. It's not if you're obeying the Lord. And that's what we're going to encourage you to do. What a privilege to have a bunch of you from YWAM today with us that I could help share this word with you. Because you guys are going to be called out to places and you're going to have to trust the Lord. And all you got to do is know his spirit's with you. He's writing a letter on your heart that people are going to read. Wherever you go, they're going to see it. And they, that letter's beautiful. Don't worry. They, they're the ones that read. Just let him do the writing of his spirit on your heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these glorious words in your scriptures that bring us closer to you and the things that you have for us. I pray, Lord, this would go with us, Lord, in a, in a, in a manner that helps us to be able to keep our focus on you, our, our heart toward you, Lord. And Lord, if there be anything hindering your shining through us, Lord, Lord, clen cleanse our glass. Lord, wipe us clean. Make us, make us vessels that can possess your light in such a way that all men would see it shining through us. We just ask that you would do that in our lives as we go from here. In Jesus' name we pray these things. And all God people said, Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.